The scripture reading today comes from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. This text is written in the first person, and the I in question is the prophet Ezekiel. Hear the word of the Lord. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy, and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit upon you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. I have at least two dear friends who are brilliant and devout and love Jesus with everything they've got, and are at the same time terrified of the concept of eternity. One of them told me once that as a kid, she would uh, stay up at night and try to wrap her head around the idea of heaven, of eternal life, and the dread of it would just keep her up. This is common enough, apparently, that there's a word for it on Google, though I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, a pyrophobia or something like that. It's the fear of eternity. It's not a fear of judgment or of hell or even a fear of God. It's a fear of the long stretching out of time without end or change. I wonder if this doesn't explain the mixed reception of things like immortality in our culture. In our literature and our movies, we seem to demonstrate this instinctive knowledge that what makes life precious is its precariousness. Life is limited and subject to change, but if life just stretches on and on, we have the instinct that everything that makes life worth living loses its power. We tell stories and have since the ancient times of people who gain immortality, and those stories almost always involve them regretting it. They become lonely, they grieve everything they've lost, they're bored. We tell these stories of people existing long 
after everything that made the world lovely to them has died or been destroyed. We tell these stories because we feel on an instinctive level that life is lovely and noble and beautiful and tragic and joyful precisely because we know it's not going to last. We feel like gaining immortality is losing something that makes us human. In our stories, the people who gain immortality become vampires or demons or gods. So some of us, at least, when we hear the words in the creed that we believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, have a hard time receiving that as good news. It comes with a sense of dread. Eternity is hard and scary to wrap our heads around. Immortality tends to scare us. But the other option is death, and that tends to scare us too. Death is what Ezekiel sees when the Lord catches him up in the spirit and sets him down in this valley of dry bones. Isn't that a fun name? Normally, uh, church shorthand names aren't that great, but this one is fantastic. They are not just, not just a valley of bodies, that would be bad enough. It's not even just a valley of bones, they're dry bones. Can't make a mistake about those. They're not asleep, they're dead, and they're not coming back to life. A valley of dry bones is a nightmare scenario. It's something that you'd see on a horror movie or on the cover of a metal album. Skeletons scare us a little bit like eternity scares us because something that is like a human isn't. Humans become skeletons when they are stripped, literally, of everything that makes them human. We're skeletons when our memories and our personalities and our hopes and our skills and even our flesh is stripped away from us. We become vampires or gods or demons, maybe, when we are given too much life, but we become skeletons when we don't have enough. Those bones in the particular valley God showed Ezekiel in his vision didn't represent a few individuals caught in some kind of terrible accident or natural disaster. It represented a whole community. They're dead, yes, but also they're living. And their future, their children who hadn't been born yet. They're not all dead yet, but they're all past the point of no return. A dead community walking. The tiny tiny community of Israel at, at the time is in exile. They're living among people who are much more powerful and culturally influential than they are, and it seems like their future is just inevitable. It seems obvious and inescapable that they're going to be slowly swallowed up by a bigger culture. They might hold on until they die but their children and their grandchildren are going to slowly forget a culture they've never experienced and a nation they've never lived in. And the whole community will be gone with their relationships and their beauty and their knowledge and their art and their tradition and their stories. Just dry bones on the ground in a valley. Those bones, like all bones, had a specific time and place and a unique story. But their fate is not unique. Reduced to dry bones on the ground, they could be any of us, all of us, the whole world, caught in the grip of entropy and winding down towards zero, towards nothing. All of us are or will be those bones in the valley. Dreams spent, hope lost, flesh itself withered away in the face of death. And so God's question to Ezekiel becomes intensely relevant to us and to our family and to our community and to our world. Mortal, 
these bones live. Ezekiel knows something about God. At any rate, he knows better than to try to tell God what is and isn't possible. So Ezekiel's not going to say no, but he also isn't going to say yes. Those bones are really, really dry. And he knows something about how bones work, too. Ezekiel knows something about God and something about the world. But only God knows the fate of those bones. Only God knows if there's a way out of the twin tragedies of endlessly stretched out life and death. But when God tells Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones, he obeys. Now, prophesying in the Bible is more like preaching is to us than telling the future. We say prophesying, we think about telling the future. But if you look at what uh, Ezekiel does here, he's preaching. That's, that's often the case. If you look even at the prophets, they preach. It's a way to convey the word of God to God's people. Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord was that the bones should live, that the bones should be knit together again by tendons and ligaments, that they should be covered with flesh and skin and animated with breath and spirit. And the valley of dry bones turns into a crowd of people again. But God isn't done yet. He's got a promise. My people... I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Despite the fact that God's people seem to be far past the point of no return, Despite the fact that they seem to be dry bones, they will live again. This is a corporate promise to Israel, but it hints at Jesus' own literal death and physical resurrection that we celebrate every Sunday and in a special way at Easter. And it hints at the fact that even in our individual life, the grave is not our last home. We, too, will be raised from the dead to a life that's eternal. We believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. But notice this. It's not life for its own sake. It isn't a mere continuous piling on of day after day after day after day forever that looks a lot like the old life, but just longer. We're right as a race to be wary of that. We're right to feel like it would make us less than human. The new life, the days, are incidental to the real goal. The bones, you notice, are given life so that they may re be returned to their own land and know God as their Lord. That's not the kind of life that makes those who live it less human over time. It isn't about an infinitely increased quantity of life. Eternal life is a different quality of life. Eternal life is about the restoration of relationships, primarily between God and God's people, between you and God, but also between the people themselves, between you and me, you and your brother, you and your sister. Eternal life makes you more human, not less. Part of the promise God makes in this passage is that God will put us on our own soil. We will become more human, more at home, more who God created it, us to be. Think about it like this. Clocks are intended to tell time, right? And some clocks are broken or they're set wrong and they tell the wrong time or they don't tell time at all. They're still clocks in that they're not anything else. But we also know, right, that clocks that tell time are more clocky, you could say. They're more like clocks 
than, than clocks that don't tell time. And a clock that tells the wrong time is more like a clock than, you know, a, 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 a digital clock that's just blank. And it's the same way for people. Some of us learned at least the first question of the Westminster Catechism as children. It goes like this. What is the chief end of man? And by chief end, we mean something like, what are human beings for? The point of clocks is to tell time. What's the point of being human? And the answer is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. In other words, the point of being human is to be in a relationship of mutual delight with the God who created us. And when we are in that kind of relationship of delight, we become more human-y humans, if you can say it that way, than before. You're fulfilling what God created you to be. You're fulfilling your point, your purpose. And you know what those relationships feel like with human beings. There's at least one person, your best friend or your spouse, that you can be with, and at least sometimes, in some moods and some occasions. It's like time doesn't exist. An hour, a minute, a day, just, it's just, this is all the same thing, right? We say time flies when you're having fun. It's kind of like that. But it's, it's deeper than that. That's the way it is with eternal life, with the life of the world to come. We live lives of full humanity in relationships of delight, and time just doesn't matter anymore. Time doesn't affect us anymore. God's plan for us is not to make us less human, but more human. He's not going to keep us as skeletons, and he's not going to make us vampires or demons or little gods by piling on endless time. We're not promised immortality, but eternity. His plan for us is a deathless future of love and joy and delight in each other and in him. So to the God of all grace, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish far more abundantly than anything we could ask or think. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen.